listening to the Mark Bradford Alchemy for Life podcast. Father's Day week with Denise McAllister. We're here with Denise McAllister. Hi, Denise. Hi. Thanks for having me. You are so very welcome. And I just want to ask you, as I do with every interview, tell us who you are and what you do. My name is Denise McAllister, and I am an author and cultural commentator. I've worked in political media for many years. I've written for Daily Wire and The Federalist and PJ Media in various conservative outlets. I've been on various television programs as a commentator and radio with NPR and BBC and Fox News and Sean Hannity Radio. So I have a long history of working in, like I said, political media. I'm the author of several books. One is um, a co-authored with Dan Bongino called Spygate, The Attempted Sabotage of Donald J. Trump. And I have my most recent book that's just by me called What Men Want to Say to Women But Can't. So that's mainly my focus now is on, um, with that book, writing anti-feminist literature and being pro-masculinity at a time when masculinity and men are really under attack. Well, very, very nice. Um, oh, it's far more than an elevator speech. That, that was excellent, actually. That was, that was very well done. When it comes to your uh, book, the What Men Want to Say to Women But Can't, um, I guess you're in a very interesting position because you are a woman. So it sort of gives you a bit of different clout to be able to write a book like that, I would assume. Well, what's interesting is in this time of identity politics and um, the height of modern feminism and its kind of power games with men uh, for dominance, for egalitarianism, but what really is a superiority mindset uh, that comes out of egalitarianism. Uh, is that men are silenced, they're told they can't speak, they're accused of being toxic masculinity people, and that they use their power in history against women, and that they're oppressors. So anytime men kind of speak, they're, they're discounted in, in a number of ways and a number of issues. Uh, my book isn't about how men can't say these things. Men certainly do, but they're not, often not heard, they're discounted. Because masculinity, let's face it, is being delegitimized in our culture today. And feminism is at the front lines of doing that, of course. And it's being done in different sectors of society, from education to politics to science with psychology. Um, We see it on a global scale. So uh, I wanted to write a book about masculinity, why we need masculinity, the pros of masculinity, put in the frame of what men want to say to feminist women in an age that has really denigrated something that we should be valuing greatly and and developing relationships between men and women instead of tearing them down so my my book is really a goal to encourage men to help men themselves see how we got here and why women think the way they do in this modern age of feminism the faults with that but also speak to women about how they've been influenced and lied to by feminism and how it's made them lose respect for masculinity and to devalue who men are and as God designed them to be in that relationship. That is something you don't see a lot, obviously. And I think that a quick search doesn't come up with a lot of publications writing even an attitude like that. You you don't see that a lot, I guess. And I think you certainly fill a space that was there. <laughs> well, you have uh, you you just have the loud cry of feminism, and you have even people on the right who don't agree with the feminism agenda will often appease it or try to make inroads with it and reason with it instead of really standing strong on the core principles that's going on here. And it's a a lack of valuing human identity in our sexuality as it's objectively designed as men and women and defending it from a real objective truth foundational view that's uncompromising about who the sexes are and how they interact with each other and the value that each has and an honest look at how what feminism has become and why it's so detrimental to relationships between men and women and let's just face it we talk about politics a lot but like andrew breitbart said 
politics is downstream from culture. But what I write in my book is that culture is downstream from relationships, and particularly the relationships between men and women, foundationally. When that, when that relationship is disrupted, when that relationship is denigrated and devalued and separated, you have a decline in culture, you know, as well as complete chaos in politics. And unless you fix that relationship between men and women, not just in marriage, but in society between the sexes, you're not going to be able to fix what you see in politics and even the entire culture itself will be in decline. I I would wholeheartedly agree. I think I I tend to see that as you're seeing it. I I kind of see the co-centric circle view of things that if if you don't take care of things in your house, you can't take things care of things in your neighborhood and then your city and your state and your country and the world. So trying to take care of things in like the eighth circle when your first circle isn't being taken care of, it's just not going to work. So I think that is where it starts. Yeah. And if you're going to have disruption in the most foundational relationship, the starting relationship between men and women in society, you know, to try to build a cohesive society that respects liberty, respect, respects self-identity, you know, not, not made self-identity, but the individuality of each person in community with others. You're not, if you don't respect that foundational relationship, you're not going to be able to have a, a well-functioning society. You're going to have a society that's riddled with power, that groups are warring against other groups, men warring against women for dominance, instead of working together each in our different ways, because we're so different, um, but yet so much alike as human beings. And in, until we understand that relationship and understand the unique sexual identities that are men and women as made, then we're simply not going to have that cohesion and you're going to have disruption. And because feminism is so rooted now in that cultural Marxism, that um, critical theory kind of thinking about that society is based on warring factions between the oppressors and the oppressed, between the marginalized and the dominant class, when that's their only frame of reference when it comes to human thriving and human society, all you have is conflict and struggle. You don't have love, respect, peace, and an honoring people as they're made. And we see this, especially in attack against men who are seen as the patriarchal dominant historical oppressors who need to be brought down and women need to be elevated. And this is built on a wrong view of history. It's built on a wrong view of society itself and how we interact and how we build a sustaining society, you know, and it's built on a wrong understanding of how women and men are alike and how they're not. Um, One of the problems with feminism is that they think men and women are the same. And when you have that thought, you either make women more like men and fail, or you try to make men more like women and you fail. And I think the first part of modern feminism's efforts to aim for this egalitarian frame is to make women more like men, to put women in men's spheres, to say that women can do everything that men can do and that men are replaceable by women in every way. And what they found was that the results, the outcomes of that was that women weren't the same as men. They didn't have the same outcomes as men because they're different. So now we have a flip and we see feminism now today trying to reconstruct masculinity, deconstruct masculinity, reframe masculinity, make men more reflective of feminine feminine ideals and denigrating them whenever they do act like men and guilting them into acting not like men so that women can feel like they're, that again, they've reached this egalitarian sameness by making men more like women. And it's a disaster. It creates conflict and chaos. Yes, well said. You mentioned uh, women sort of moving into the space of men and so forth. And also everything that you just said, could it not be said that you are celebrating diversity? (laughs) Right? I mean, that's literally literally what you're saying you're doing in this book and and the and your um, outlook on this. Isn't that correct? Well, that's the irony of Mm -hmm. feminism today and, and all the identity politics, whether it's sexuality or race or gender is that it's egalitarian at its core which erases diversity but yet they say that they're for all these things in the name of diversity but they're really not because their aim is not respecting diversity 
it's it's wanting equality of outcomes right. and which is egalitarianism mm -hmm. so that's the measure by by which everything is is looked at it's not looked at are we being the best men and men that we can be? Are we being the best women that we can be? Do we have opportunities as women? Do we have opportunities as men, which we do in this free society? Uh, as, as imperfect as it is, we do have liberty and rights that are protected by law, which has been a you know, beautiful thing in American culture and has been for years. But what we don't have is equality of outcomes, and neither should we. Because when you demand equality of outcomes, you are making an egalitarian argument of making everyone the same. And that erases, erases diversity and in individuality, and it robs people of liberty. Right. And I would imagine that, now you're married, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And so you see the marriage side of this sort of thing. Uh, I'm currently single. I like the word currently because it sounds like it's so temporary and short. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm divorced, and um, I ended up raising my, my my two kids by myself for the last ten years of before they had launched, and so that was an eye opener. And a lot of the things that you say, I saw that and I experienced firsthand, um, like literally being chased out of uh, dressing areas because I was a male and my daughter only had me to count on as far as like taking her for like prom dress stuff. And so I, I, I saw a lot of things that just amazed me. And then in dating, I have, and I've said this many times that um, it's become more of a competition. So versus the playful banter of a first date has been replaced with more of a, I'm better than you kind of thing. I can do I can do this better than you can kind of thing. And I just there's this this energy that's there that wasn't there not that long ago. And I think it's it's indicative of, of the things that you're talking about. Well, it's asserting power and dominance and and even if you're not aiming for dominance, you're asserting kind of this positioning with the other person um, about what you can do and about, you know, what positions you hold or about your professional world or your feelings or whatever they are, instead of looking at the other person as another human being equal in value to you, but who is very, very different and who you complement as the opposite sex right? and respecting that and understanding that and honoring that. And that's why in my book, I really cover, I cover how this disruption in this relationship, like you described is in the home. I describe it, you know, in marriage in the home as fathers. I describe what it looks like in the workplace and what it's ha what's happened there. I described how it looks in sex and, and how um, the, our sexual relationship between men, men and women have changed. And I look at it in, you know, just in how men in our men as protectors and in particularly in military and uh, men as the strength and backbone of society and how women have imagined that they're the same and equal to men in this way and they're simply not and how disruptive that that is. So I look at all those areas and and analyze what feminism has done and how it's created this immature feminine mindset that denigrates masculinity and how it's affected men and and again affected the relationships yeah and 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 as i said you're, you're right on all that and as i had said i see that from the outside looking in uh when it comes to 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 dating and and just what has changed i have a good friend who's a uh matchmaker and dating coach and we've had a, a, a tremendous amount of discussions about how things have become so much more difficult because of that and it's just such a refreshing thing to meet a woman who isn't carrying all that stuff on her shoulders she's just being herself she's just being a woman <laughs> and that's that's it you know without trying to attach lots of adjectives that one could be attacked for i'm just saying she just behaves as a woman and i behave as a man and somehow we just gel well, and respecting that and, and understanding it, you know, for, for example, in the area of sexuality and sexual relationships, understanding that men are not like women. And I think too many women, and I'm talking in the marriage relationship because I'm an advocate, of course, of sex within marriage, that in that in that marriage relationship, understanding that men process differently and physically as men, you know, as sexual beings. They're not like women. They're very visual. They're very, you know, sensual as in touch and, and feel. And uh, they're, they're not, they're not like women and they don't need to be acting like men. I mean, like women. And 
that their attraction to the female form and attraction to women is perfectly natural. That's not toxic masculinity. You know, if a man looks at a woman and finds her attractive in the workplace, it doesn't mean that he's an awful person and needs to shut down that part of himself. Now he should rape her or sexually harass her. That's not what I'm advocating, but this natural dance between men and women of attraction, that's just part of our nature. It, you know, men have been guilted in about their own feelings and about their own desires as men for for the feminine. And it's when it's perfectly natural, you know, and in the sexual relationship, they aren't always going to go to the feelings and the relational connection first. But that doesn't mean that they're not relationally or feeling connected. You know, when they've worked all day long, you know, at work, they're tired, you know, and they're, you know, stressed out or whatever. When they come home, they they get rejuvenated and they get connection from the physical. And so if they just want to have sex, it doesn't mean that they have to have this whole litany of buildup of wooing the woman all day and giving her flowers. You know, nothing wrong with all that. But women too often just say, well, if he just comes in and wants to have sex with me, he's being selfish and he shouldn't do that. He should, he, he should tend to my feelings and talk to me more and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, no, him, him wanting to have sex with you and only you is itself loving and an indicator of his need for you. He's expressing it physically and you're giving it to him physically because you love him. And after that, and, and, and from that, you become more connected and more joined in, in the relate in the talking and the feeling and all that comes later or sometimes before it doesn't matter but again it's understanding and respecting the differences and not pigeonholing it as something abusive you know or toxic when it's just men being men and that's right. okay and that's good and it's good in its own right right stop and trying to make men into women I'm sorry to interrupt you. And, and right, and keeping in mind that what you're talking about is 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 within a certain lane, and there is fringe on either side of what you're talking about. Obviously, there are toxic relationships, and other, obviously sure. there are communication problems in certain relationships, and there are people who are selfish and people who are who are codependent and blah blah blah. All that stuff doesn't need to be said, but it needs to be said so that we understand that the thing you're talking about is sort of not ideal, but you know, an optimal relationship. And when we're talking about that, I, I, I think I've made the observation that if there's an issue in a relationship, it seems like the default is that men want to be physical to show that everything's okay. It's almost their way of saying, look, everything's okay between us because I can do this with you. And women want to make sure everything's okay before they do that. And, <laughs> right. and that creates a bit of an impasse sometimes in some relationships. But I think once you recognize that, you can you can get through that. Well, once you recognize, and I do at the preface of my book, I, I say, I am not talking about abusive relationships and that's not my default. I am right. talking about normal relationships between two people who love each other when I'm talking about the sexual aspect. Right. Uh, you know, that's my assumption is you're married, you love this person. Okay. And if you don't, if you're abu- if there's abuse, that's a different issue entirely. And there can be abuse on the side of the woman or on the side of the man in those relationships. But if that's the problem, that needs to be dealt with separately. That's a psychological, emotional issue. That's not a masculinity issue. That's not, you know, a femininity issue. That's it's a relational issue that you need to work out. But in the in the realm of the norm, you know, men, you know, talking about those relationships, if your man needs sex in order to decompress in order to be connected because that's how he connects give it to him that's you loving him and that's him loving you now if he never talked to you ever and he never gave you the woman in in ways that you need um then of course that's a problem as well you know that's neglect that's not respect on his part um but you woman if you're never giving to him what he needs because you're wanting him to act just like you then you're at fault for for you know neglecting him i mean and and just coming to an understanding about how men process and who men are as men helps you know in the context of love to understand that relationship Exactly. And exactly why I thought I should sort of throw that on the table of, even though it's assumed by most people that what we're talking about is the, I don't want to say normal, but, but, a, but a positive, you know, a, a positive nurturing relationship is, is that's, that's the sandbox that we're talking about in here. And then all that other stuff that goes without saying sometimes has to be said so that people don't get the wrong impression and say, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? That's not what you're talking about. You're talking about 
a very positive relationship where both people want it to succeed. Well, we don't, we should never have, um, talks about the norm by looking to the outliers. <laughs> you know, that's right. not that's illogical and it's not how we how we communicate. You know, outliers are outliers. And, you know, we need to talk about what's the norm and what's the good and what's the real and and um within the, a good relationship. You know, it's the same way with with um the mother and father to the children relationship. Too many women judge fathers on the basis of their own motherhood instead of respecting fatherhood as fatherhood and that fathers raise children differently than mothers do and that's needed we don't but yet we we too often put men into a frame of you got to be acting like the women doing like the women emoting like the women um protecting the children like a woman does you know instead of letting the father be the father and leading the children into a world where they have to be toughened up and where they have to deal with the hardness of life and help them grow out of the arms of the mother it's harder to be a father in a lot of ways than it is to be a mother to be a mother i'm not saying that it's not hard to be a mom don't get me wrong ladies <laughs> i've raised six children i know um so i mean being a mom is a difficult thing but it's pure, very very natural to the child and to the mother to have that loving safe um, protective relationship the hard thing for a father is it's the father's job to bring the children out into the world to raise them to be facing the difficulties of life and dad does a hard job and it's not always pleasant and the children don't always like it. So dad sometimes is viewed as the big meanie or the trouble, you know, and he's the hard one, but he's supposed to be the hard um, force in the house to, to train up the children to go out into the world away from mom's protective feminine sphere. But too often, and what we've had a society now is feminizing child raising and it's extended into education where boy, where it's all feminine oriented boys are expected to act like girls they're kept into the in the nest you know all the way up to the age of 26 within a feminine frame instead of relying on the masculine that really makes strong individuals of both boys and girls coming out to being able to face life um, in a way that that just women don't naturally do. And I'm not saying that women can't raise their children to do that. They also play a role in it. I'm talking about our natural instincts and our natural inclinations of raising children. And I've just seen too often women shut down fathers and relegate fathers away from the children saying that their way is better. I hear in the church, I hear it everywhere, you know, the women's way, the mom's way. If mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. I really hate that that whole th mindset. Mm -hmm. It's very feminine focused and it's wrong and it's hurtful to the children. You know, sometimes mama might need to be unhappy because dad stepped in and said, this is the way things need to be. And he's wise about it. And we need to follow his lead. Well, I saw I saw quite a bit of what you are describing in in tangible real life circumstances with my kids and seeing just what culture, friends, uh, people I didn't know, their default perception of me. Uh, you know, I, I'd be at, at dinner with my uh, daughter and someone would say, oh, is today daddy daughter day? No, today's Tuesday. <laughs> I'm a father. Like, it's full time. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, it was just, it, it was just the, uh, and I try to walk that line because I understand people's perceptions and I understand that, you know, people inherently expect good and are good. But the perception, again, the default was never there while I was raising them. The default was that I was just a goofy guy who happened to have the kids today. <laughs> Versus yeah, fathers. Yeah, I mean, fathers have been relegated, and we've seen this in commercials and television shows and movies. I mean, dad's the goofball, and the mom's always the one who's well, look the at, stable one. Look at Father's Day commercials versus Mother's Day commercials, and you will just be shocked. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just an amazing thing. I, I, I wait for it, and I cringe every year. It's the same thing. I have, uh, I had a guest on the show. Uh, he is actually the gentleman from Wales who co-established uh, International Men's Mental Health Day. And um, he went through some very interesting times with raising his son with his wife that caused him to realize just how much the father's mental health was being ignored when it came to raising children. 
Um, and like you said, they were sort of being relegated. So we actually established that. And it's very interesting, almost barometer of talking about it with some people where they would just clap and others would just wrinkle their nose at that and say, well, that was a silly thing. <laughs> Well, and it's sad that we, especially in this day when the mental health of the father really does need to be tended to because they're so under attacked and underappreciated and working against the stream of things. And in divorce, if they're the um, single father raising kids, he has to be mom and dad. I mean, just like the single mothers do, it's hard in the divorce situation. But even in that, they're going to handle things differently. And even within a marriage that's stable and, and, and healthy, um, they're going to handle things differently and they have stress on them, but they're not tended to, they're criticized all the all the time and they're not respected and honored as men, you know, not, not even in the workplace, I mean, in the workplace, it's like they're, they're expendable. They're, they're just there like, like placeholders until a woman can fill it and, and somehow she'll do it better and she should do it better because, you know, the man's in the workplace have been so uh, oppressive to women and women can do absolutely everything a man can when that simply is not true. I mean, there are many things that women can do that the, as well as men. I'm not saying that, but I'm, what I'm saying is that they do things differently. And there are some jobs that men are better equipped to do. And I really think of military in that way, front lines, you know, there's strength that's involved, but also just how men are designed because they're not bearing children to be out there working all the time with a strength that women don't have. Women have a lot of choices. Men don't. And, uh, you know, so... In, in today's world, because, you know, women can be at home or not at home or, or this, but men still are expected and need to be in the workplace, ra um, helping raise their children and provide for their families. But they're denigrated in that. And that takes its toll on the mental health of men. I mean, that's why we have a talk about in the book. Um, the group called MAGTAL, which is men going their own way, which is this kind of schism group of men who have like kind of thrown up their hands and saying, I really don't even want to be in an intimate relationship with women anymore because I'm abused. You know, I'm not appreciated. Um, and, you know, I, I get married and they just take all my stuff because I don't live up to their expectations. It's kind of a bitter kind of movement. And it's sad. I, I don't recommend it as a solution, but I certainly understand why it's there and why men are frustrated and giving up on relationships and angry. So um, that's one reason why I wrote the book is, is I think there's a lot of frustration and quiet desperation among men, which is ironic because when feminism first started in the 50s and 60s, it was born out of women writing about female quiet desperation. And I think we've had a flip. Now we have you know, men in quiet desperation going, you know, how am I supposed to be a father? How am I supposed to be a lover? How am I supposed to be a provider? How am I supposed to be um, someone who loves and work and wants to really be creative and productive and be honored for that as a man? And instead of going to work and saying, you know, having to kowtow to women who don't do the same work as I do, but yet they want to get paid the exact same even though they don't do the same work and they don't do the same amount of work and they don't have the same experience, you know, women in the workplace acting the way that they do as women and yet demanding that men kowtow to everything that they do and everything that they say and everything has to be female driven. And if they don't, the men are somehow being abusive. I and mean, this is a terrible time for men in all honesty. And they're under attack in a society that sees them as the oppressors. This takes a serious mental toll and physical toll on men. And it, does, it doesn't need to be that way. And it shouldn't be that way. Women should be a support to men and encouragement to men. Uh, women should be enlivening men to be the best that they can be. You know, I, I talk about the wonders of men, that they're glorious creatures. They're strong and they're creative and they're imaginative and they're, uh, you know, they're, they're, they'll, they'll conquer the world for the people they love. I mean, they're truly extraordinary. And, you know, to denigrate them is, is to lose something of ourselves and our own humanity and society. And it grieves me to see it happening. I think quiet desperation is a very accurate term, first of all. <laughs> I think I think that that so sums up what so many people feel right now because they do have to be quiet because quiet equals strong, and so they're forced to be that way because they're told to be strong. I uh, 
Well, they're also told just not to talk because otherwise they're being toxic males. <laughs> so well, that's, don't that's, criticize the women. Well, there's that. There, <laughs> I, I remember when I was going through my divorce and I was attending a, a small church up the street. I actually had a neck brace on because I had uh, I recently had neck surgery at the time, and I had my two little kids in tow. And you know, there's it was icy, and and if I had fallen, I probably would have died. And I remember going to the church and then talking to people later afterwards and saying, you know, no one really ever came up to me and asked me if I was okay. I guess I was a little surprised at that, considering the setting, let's say. And finally, someone told me, said, well, you just seemed so strong. <laughs> well, well, there, well in, in one way, I'll be honest, in one way, that encourages me, in one way, in that we, men are strong. And, you know, so that if we're making the assumption and not treating men like little boys, okay, well, that, that's kind of a good thing. I'm glad, you know, hey, he's got it taken care of. He's strong. Um, so that's great. I'm, I'm glad that, that we make that assumption about men because men are to be the leaders. They are to be strong. But on the other hand, given the times that we live in and given the humanity of men um, and given the struggles of men, I think that to neglect the real plight of men in our society, especially a single father um, who has his kids with him, not to be sensitive to the struggles that that incurs on its own is to be neglectful of the man. So I kind of have a two fold view of that, that we should be in this time being aware of these. And my whole book is about being aware of the struggles of men in these times, you know, but, uh, you know, because they, they are not looked upon with respect and with sensitivity and with awareness of how they're dealing with the struggles of life brought on by the chaos of feminism and the disruptions to the relationships that it causes. And so in, in, in writing this, were you, uh, were you uh, given or did you seek out uh men's stories and so forth for, uh, uh, well i have yeah i i um well i've been writing I, I talk about my preface to kind of explain my book my book is very much about it's almost memoir in some parts because i talk about my own personal experience from the woman's point of view as a woman who respects masculinity and what i've learned about masculinity both good and bad and what i've come out of it about um how i've seen men not behave well and how I've seen men behave well and how I, how I have not allowed men's bad, the bad experiences of men define all men. So I felt like I was a voice that was balanced in the sense that I'm not coming from a Pollyannish look at men. I, I've had horrible experiences with, with bad men in my life, but bad men do not define masculinity. And so throughout my life, you know, I've talked to men, I, you know, I've, I was raised by a father who, you know, had good parts and bad parts. And I learned, I, I saw the bad parts and learned what that was not a good male, but I also learned, learned good parts. And, um, I'm very much a listener. I am a social commentator and cultural commentator and theologian and very aware of, of what men are going through. And so for years, I've been writing about in my journalistic capacity about the sexuality issues and about men's issues and about women's feminism and, and opposing feminism. So I've talked to many, many, many men and listened to many, many men <laughs> about a lot of different issues from their complaints about women in the workplace. Whenever I hear a man complaining about women in the workplace, I I don't shut him down. I want to hear what he has to say. And what I found from listening to men is they all had some common themes. And I wrote about that in my book. Um, you know, men have talked to me a lot about their marriages, about their sex lives, about frustrations, about frustrations, about how to date in the age of Me Too movement, um, you know, and about, uh, you know, all this. So I, I listened to the men. But but beyond that, you know, so I, yeah, I, I, it's all built on those testimonies of men reading about what's happened to men, false accusations, reading about men who have had to go through lawsuits because they've been falsely accused of sexual harassment or, uh, you know, horrible divorce battles. I've listened to many, many men about divorce and I've been divorced and I've been on both sides of, you know, I, I, my whole life's a journey too. And I've seen how, in, through divorce courts, how I was advantaged by being a woman I've also seen how women, how, um, you know, in cases with like my husband, who's also divorced, how he was 
given the shaft in the, in, in the divorce courts by a woman. And I saw how I was given advantages as a woman and how unfair that was and how men are so easily falsely accused in courts and uh, and lose lots of things in, in courts when it should be, if women really wanted it to be equal, it should be more equal. So I, I've, I've heard a lot, I've heard from fathers frustrated about raising their children. And, you know, so it's, I've talked to military men frustrated about what's happened in the military. I was raised by a Marine and lived in outside of Camp Lejeune during the Vietnam War. I mean, I've, I've listened to the, the sadness of the tales of men about what's happened to the military because of the social experimentation of introducing women into male roles. But undergirding all of these personal experiences, whether they're mine or yours or men or in general, or women, uh, you know, listening to women as well, because of course you know, I'm a woman and I hear about all that as well, um, is the underlying foundational objective truths about who men and women are and about how it should be and about how God has designed us to be. And our personal experiences don't eradicate that. And I want to pe- bring people back to how we should be, how we ought to be, how we ought to think about each other and respect the, you know, what is masculinity? What is femininity? How do those work together? And how can we respect that to foster love within marriage, love, mutual affection within society and respect in the workplace and all of these things that are so foundational to society, like I said at the outset. Mm-hmm. And I think what, what, you're, what you're saying uh, is, a, is a wonderful and wonderfully detailed example of the fact that you can build up someone or a sector without pulling down other people or another sector. I mean, you're, 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 you're building men up without taking women down, (laughs) you know, that Mm -hmm. is exactly what you're doing. And it is very, very possible. And it's very, very normal. And I can be very honest about bad men. And I can be very honest about bad women. And I can be very honest about what feminism has done to weaken women and make them crazy. And about what feminism has done to make men weak. But from all of that, I can also step back and go, yeah, that's a big mess. And that's what I'm addressing. But at the core of it, there are good men, there are good women, and there's a good design designed objectively by God about how men and women are and should be with each other. And that should be our goal. And that should be our standard. Because if I let my negative experiences with men, and I've had several, define my relationships with men, I would be a raging feminist today. I would be an angry, bitter old hag who just thinks men stink and that women are better, <laughs> you know, but I don't because I also see how horrible women can be. I can, I've seen how horrible I've been in the past. I've seen how, um, you know, that the, it, it kind of goes when it comes to good behavior and bad behavior, it's shared among the sexes and, and we can't live in denial of that, but we also can't let that reduce us and define us. And I'm afraid that men have been reduced to the worst common denominator and then redefined according to to that denominator instead of looking at men elevated, looking at men, like I've said about as the glorious creatures that they are as men and, and honoring them and wanting to see them grow and flourish and succeed. I talk about men in the workplace. There's nothing more beautiful than to see a man who loves his work invested in it, being creative in it, uh, finding self-esteem in it and respecting that and honoring that. And they, they find it in a way that's very different from a woman. Um, because you know when it comes to creativity and in the workplace or in, in their lives that men, men love to create, men love to conquer the world. They love to you know, build houses out of sticks and build you know, boats on, you know, and just, they're very creative and very productive. And it's part of their imaginative mind. One thing that's different about them with women, women can also do all those things, but unlike men, women can create from within. They can create out of their own bodies. They can make children. They're they're creative by their very essence. And that's a glorious thing for women, even if they're not doing it, even if they aren't mothers, is part of their psyche. And it's something that they can go back to and rest in and find glory in, in their very creative way of being. So even if they're being creative outwardly, that doesn't, I mean, they love that. And I love to create, I'm an artist, I'm a writer. I do all kinds of things that that just give me joy creatively. But with men, that's all they have. 
men can't create within themselves and the creative impulses of men are outward oriented. That's why they're the conquerors of the world. They're the, the great artists and the great chefs and the, all these things. It's not just because they've always given the, been given the opportunities within history. It's, it's just really who they are. And it's part of their being as providers and conquerors and, and subduers of, of chaos. And it, it, they gain so much uh, self-esteem, like I said, and so much self-respect and and glo- and joy um, in doing those things, and we need to honor that and not suppress them and take it away and say, "Oh, you're you you worked hard to become that CEO because you're a man and you've oppressed women, and you, that needs to be taken away from you because you're a man." And I don't respect anything you did. I don't respect the cities you built or the. <laughs> things that you've conquered, you know, for the good, you know, and I don't respect any of that because you're a man. No, I mean, they've done those things because it's been born out of their own creative self. And we need to honor that and respect it and not try to take it over because we're in some kind of war with them. Um, You know, women should be able to create and do whatever they want as they can and as they want to, but they don't need to take away from men in doing that. And women have the added ability to go home and have babies, which gives them a whole different kind of joy. So, uh, you know, I I just think the denigration of men as men and not appreciating them, you know, in all their spheres, them as fathers, they have a whole world to offer um, that women don't see and women don't do, uh, you know, that we need to honor that compliments the women, you know, and their sexual drive. I mean, delight that men find desire in women, delight that they love feminine beauty and that they want to capture it and hold it and love it and, and be united with it in body. You know, love that. Love that they, you know, find your breast attractive. You know, know, they think you're beautiful in your form. It's natural. It's fine. And it's glorious. And and women secretly don't want it any other way. Why why do women dress up the way they do? They want men to look. And so um, this is the dance uh, of the masculine and the feminine. And we really need to honor it. Mm -hmm. Well, then, I... uh... First of all, you mentioned self-esteem and and the workplace, and I and I do know that studies have shown that a large portion of a man's identity does come from his work in that mm-hmm. way, and that's why it is so devastating for men to lose their jobs because there is there isn't that other thing. I mean, not to take anything away from fatherhood or raising children, especially someone you know who, who if someone had to raise their kids by themselves as a, as a man, certainly don't want to take anything away from that, but it does have a tremendous effect on men far greater. I mean, even suicide rates for men who lose their job versus women is, is very skewed. And I think a lot of that comes from, you know, that, that whole self-esteem being connected to this identity that they keep building and building and building upon. Well, that's why in totalitarian societies where where the state has t- taken over production and um, men are just regulated to rote jobs and, and uh, there's no creativity, there's no self-worth, there's no attainment, there's no conquering within a certain sphere and becoming great. Uh, there's no climbing mountains and conquering the skies and you know all that comes from freedom. Uh, there's the reason why in those societies men are... Uh, riddled with alcoholism, suicide, depression, despair. Uh, they don't care about anything. They're they're like, you know, uh, Winston Smith in 1984, just sitting there in a corner and struggling desperately to hold on to something that's real. And uh, this affects men, it affects women in a different way, but in men in a very unique way, like I just explained. And because that is part of their identity, the provider, the conqueror, the creator, the magician, if you will, to use Kantian, um, I mean, uh, terms, is that, I'm sorry, I'm Jungian, excuse me, I'm thinking of another philosophy, but um, Carl Jung's um, um, archetypes and, you know, to be, to be the magician and which is part of his, you know, creativity and, and all of that, it's very much part of him. And one thing I hate to see in our society is, is, that being eroded by the state, by by women, um, denigrating men in, in positions of power, not stepping back and thinking, well, these men worked really, really hard to get there, <laughs> you know, um, sacrificed a lot. They worked hard for their families, for their society. And now you're just saying it's meaningless and that needs to be taken away from them, all in the name of egalitarian equality. And, you know, that that's just cruel. And it's wrong and it's dehumanizing to men and it's on the advance now. 
and with the Equality Act that's that's been shown, you know, um, being advocated that women get the same as men for outcomes, even though they're very different and producing very differently. Uh, it, it's it's taking away from men in order to give to women and it's stripping them of their humanity. Yeah, and it, it's tragic. And I really am a very afraid for our society because of what we're doing to men mm-hmm. and what women are doing to themselves. Really, this also has a flip side. Right. And another book can be written about what feminism has done to women in particular. And I actually do cover some of that in my book about how women have hurt themselves and not being honest with themselves about who they are as women and what their needs are as women. Women are unhappy too and miserable too, because they're not really understanding the glories of their own femininity and its um, relationship with men. So they're either, they're either trying to be like men and failing because they can't be, or they're being women and then trying to make men be like women and losing the relationship with a strong masculine male and, and being lost, you know, just isolated. Yeah, you know, so it's it's very sad what, what's happening to our our society. It's very personal. I think it's touched every single one of us in some way, mm-hmm. in the workplace, in our singlehood, in our marriage, in sex. You know, um, so it's in our you know raising children. It's affected every single one of us, and it's hurt every single one of us. Well, you have so much to say on this. I hope that people who are listening and finding you fascinating as I am, uh, I hope they do pursue your book. And I, I wanted to also say that I did promise you I wouldn't take more than an hour of your time. We're getting close to that. So I don't want to take more of your time than I had promised. So before I do that, I want to make sure first, first of all, that you uh, let people know uh, again, the title of your book and where they can find it. It's what men want to say to women, but can't. And you can get it on Amazon. You can get it at Barnes and Noble. Uh, and it's it's not a, a long read. It's an easy read. Like I say, I bring in history. I bring in analysis. I bring in philosophy. Um, I bring in psychology. But I also talk. And I bring in religion. Uh, but I also. But that's not the main point. It's my book is written on the basis of a Christian worldview. But that's it's not a Christian book per se. It's um, I really look at practical matters, which is why I bring in a lot of personal stories. There's a lot of memoir involved in it, um, where I share my own personal stories to connect with my readers uh, so they can understand my own journey um, in understanding masculinity and all its forms. And so, uh, you know, I hope it's it's a book that will both encourage men and maybe enlighten them about what feminism, you know, some men may go, why are these women acting this way? <laughs> I can, you know, in the workplace or at home, my book explains it. Uh, and I hope it also challenges women who will dare to read it and, and take the hits about how they've been corrupted and lied to by feminism and kind of point them in a direction of, of honoring and celebrating masculinity again. And it's available in both hardcover and Kindle. It is in Kindle, yes, in hardcover. Awesome. That is wonderful. Do you have any um, shout outs or anything you'd like to say before we do close it? Um, just that, you know, please buy my book, pass it around, you know, um, and <laughs> uh, share book. it. Share the word. You can you can follow me on Twitter at McAllister Den or Gab at Denise McAllister. I write for the American Thinker now, and I also write at Gatekeepers Online, where it's just really where you see a lot of my more religious based writing, uh, where I c- cover a lot of issues about identity and about sexual identity, human identity, because I think really at the core. Besides an, an abandonment of, obje- of objective truth generally, I think on the on the foundation of that is a loss of understanding identity, who we are um, mm-hmm. as created beings, who we are as human beings, and what we share in common. You know who we are as male and female, and understanding what the differences there and how they interact and also just understanding how our individuality that makes us very unique and unlike anyone else interacts with those two other aspects of our being that are shared with the rest of humanity. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, that the celebration of the individual for the sake of the individuality, but also not at the expense of our sexuality and our humanity. Oh, nicely, nicely done. Uh, I'm assuming the answer is going to be no to this, but is there anything else that we haven't touched on in the book that you think is important for people to know? (laughs) Well, I think think we've generally (laughs) touched on it. I I really encourage people to think about the different spheres that where men and women interact and how feminism has really 
weaseled its way into our psyche. Uh, you know, I really encourage um, talking about, we didn't talk a lot about male strength and male men as protectors and that women shouldn't be, you know, on the front lines and defending men, no matter what feminists say. And I know, I know a lot of men have the attitude, even men who are more conservative and they're thinking, okay, well, well, if women want that, women want equality, well then fine, you can get your butts on the front line and die with the rest of us. We shouldn't be the only ones, but I, I encourage men not to think so despairingly and bitterly about that, but in don't be like feminists who react to bad women by denigrating women. You know, bad women and feminists react to bad men <laughs> by denigrating men mm -hmm. instead of elevating men and then recognizing who they are as feminine. Uh, you know, I just encourage that let's fight for, let's not give ground to feminism. Let's not give ground to the cultural Marxist. I, I want to encourage men not to give up. I want to encourage men to not be angry even though I understand their anger and I talk about their anger, I encourage men not to be in despair because they are loved. There are women who do love men as men and understand what that means. Um, I encourage fathers to please, please foster a healthy love for masculinity if their daughters don't give in to the feminist um, agenda. You know, I encourage husbands to do the same. I mean, love and respect your wives and, you know, but be, be a man, don't give in. You know, don't be lording over your power, but I'm saying, you know, don't give in to the feminist. Don't give in to that mindset. Uh, you know, be met, you know, get encouragement from other men, not in a bitter way, not in an us against the women way, which I see sometimes happening with male groups. But, you know, how can we push lovingly against this onslaught against masculinity in a way that still respects God's design for women and real women out there that we want to have relationships with in society and in our marriage. So I just really encourage men to do that, to, to be strong, to not give up, to not give up in the war against cultural Marxism. Please don't. Um, and, and still honor and love women as you're called to do. And that's going to be hard because it's a fight because you're going to be dealing with women who are bucking and screaming and don't want to be loved as women. <laughs> they just don't. Uh, that's why I make the uh, comparison to uh, the taming of the shrew by Shakespeare, where Kate kind of kicks other women <laughs> in the tail and says, you know, you women are unruly and ungrateful. You need to knock it off. And that's kind of what I'm doing with other women, kind of, just kind of waking them up and challenging them to stop being bitter old hags and start being the kind of women to men that they're designed to be. And I have the luxury of, as a woman, to do that, and and that's why I wrote my book. But I also encourage men, you know, to to be strong and encourage each other, and encourage the women in their lives, and to respect these identities that that God has given us in a relationship to love and that and and to build each other up and don't give up. Very cool. A very very good wrap up at the end there too. Very very good um, summary, I guess you'd say. Uh, sort of giving people motivation for actually picking up your book because I think I think if like I said, anyone who's enjoyed this conversation certainly would enjoy your book. So thank you so much for the time that you've spent chatting. It was it was uh, intriguing and enlightening. Well, thank you, and good luck in all of your endeavors, and and keep up the good fight. Oh, thank you so much. Take care. Okay, you too. Hey there, thanks for listening. I always appreciate your feedback. I really, really do. Wanted to let you know that the Sword in the Sunflower audiobook won as Best New Author for 2020. My podcast is available wherever you consume podcasts, and my books are available on Amazon. Take care.